Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. We're basically taking the earth here and we're crushing it. The earth can sustain a lot of biomass in the form of flora, like plants, plankton, and fauna, animals. We've lost about half of the biomass on the planet. I'm gonna talk about the details and how we can, if we just restore 15% of the biomass, then we can capture tremendous amounts of carbon. So I'm gonna discuss this presentation that some friends of mine have put together. Just got the lights uh, dimmed so you can see better what's going on. So we're looking at solutions. We've, we've affected the planet wide scale, large scale over time, quickly, and over the entire planet. So the causes, the effects, and the cures are what I'll be looking at here. We need a global environmental restoration project. We need to declare a global climate change emergency. We need to repair the biosphere and regrow lost biomass in order to heal the planet. We've got an additional 40% of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere now. The environmental degradation and human pressures have led to greater than 50% reduction in the total mass of living things. So the total biomass is reduced 50% on the earth. It is abundantly clear that emissions reductions alone will not, be, will not be sufficient to prevent catastrophic climate change. In fact, we're undergoing catastrophic climate change right now, abrupt climate change. So my colleagues propose that regrowing and recovering just 15% of the original biomass will draw down and store the excess 600 gigatons of carbon that's causing climate change and ocean acidification. If we do a rapid move to all non-carbon polluting energy infrastructure, i.e. zero fossil fuels, leg like one of my metaphorical bar stool, this will work. Life on Earth, including ourselves, is facing extreme danger. We can stop further damaging and then repair and restore the planet's ecology, and then the biosphere will continue to be able to support us. So let's look at some of the details. So basically, life has spent 4 billion years terraforming the Earth. So if we start here 4.6 uh, billion years ago, roughly when the Earth was formed, and then go around here, we had the moon formed, we had heavy bombardment ending and first life 4 billion years ago, photosynthesis starting 3.5 billion years ago, and then we got an atmosphere, we got snowball Earth, and then we got the development, so life is a purple line, and then we got the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes, multicellular life, so more and more complex life started appearing. Uh, Cambrian explosion, huge explosion of, of, of multicellular life. Land animals, dinosaurs came, came and went, and then humans. Look, a little tiny blip here, two million years, the first humans. So life is a colonizer. It's seeking to adapt space and make habitats that suit its requirements. We've had four and a half billion years of Earth history for life to basically do this. It recycles, it takes the finite elemental resources of the planet, uses the power of the sun, recycles nutrients, and it gets ever more diverse and efficient interdependent biological organisms. So this is some evolutionary history of the earth. So this is the Permian 225 million years ago, Pangaea one continent, continental drift to the Cretaceous 65 million years ago when the dinos disappeared or became birds, <laughs> um, and then present day. So this is the cycle of life, the Precambrian explosion and multicellular life developing in complexity. This is the um, ocean temperature change, deep ocean temperature change, millions of years before the present. So the Paleo-Eocene thermal maximum and then the various uh, different eras and cycles, orbital cycles of the Earth. The Eemian was the last interglacial. We're in the Holocene. Now two degrees is here above, above uh, pre-industrial. If you go, we go up to, on our current path, we're committed to four before the end of this century. The last time this temperature was this high was about 40 million years ago. 
So this is the global temperature changes. This is looking in the last 400,000 years. So we get the warm periods, the cool periods, okay, Eemian, and then the Holocene where we are, and CO2 concentration following lockstep, lock and then sea level rise. We've evolved through five ice age cycles over the last half a million years. We've set in motion since the Industrial Revolution, exponential climate change that will cause vastly different conditions that many species, including ourselves, may not be able to adapt to because things are changing very, very fast. CO2 is off scale. Like I said, we're on track for four degrees warming, possibly as soon as 2050 or earlier if abrupt ch change really kicks in. The CO2 level is far above pre-industrial. In fact, in fact uh, look at it this way. If you take the CO2 concentration at the beginning of the pre-industrial uh, revolution, 280, that was about 100 higher than the, at the depth of the last ice age. And now we're higher than 280 by over 120 to 130, much, much. So, so with less CO2, we had five degree cooler temperatures and we had ice covering lots of North America and Europe. And we've gone the other way, much, much more higher CO2 than that difference between the depth of the ice age and the pre-industrial. So we're going into uncharted territory very quickly. At two degrees warming, we saw the last, um, we saw sea level seven to eight meters higher, and that was 10 million years ago. The ice will take time to melt, but at four degrees above pre-industrial, there's no ice at either pole, Sea level is 70 meters higher than now. This happened 40 million years ago. During the last ice age, the sea level was 100 meters lower. And look at the world population growth. We've only had 500,000 years of human evolution. And look at the population growth here. Completely unsustainable. Okay, until now, life has created a self-regulating habitat support system. So this is a fast carbon cycle. It shows the carbon uh, the, the white numbers are stored carbon, um, the red are human contributions, and the yellow are natural fluxes. So basically the key element is carbon, and the balancing factors that allow life to maintain the Earth's temperature are within the carbon cycle, the living organic carbon cycle, and secondly, the much slower, much larger non-living carbon cycle. The balance is maintained by a transfer of the portion of the living cycle into or out of the non-living carbon cycle, but this takes time. The planetary temperature adjusts and is maintained by the level of atmospheric CO2. This has been maintained for at least the last 500,000 years between 180 and 200, and we're pushing out to 410 right now. We've disrupted this cycle by raising the levels and by altering the ecologies of both the land and the sea. So what do we do? This has disrupted the ecological balance. We've lost 50% of the total living biomass on Earth. So it reduces the size of the carbon cycle. There's a reduction in the amount of carbon that we can transfer out of the living carbon cycle into the long-term carbon cycle. So we've lost the resilience of the planet's biosphere to recover from shocks. For example, an asteroid strike could easily wipe us out in our weakened state. Whereas if we restored biomass, we would be much more resilient to surviving such an event. Same with the large-scale volcanic event. The population explosion of 7.3 billion, highly intelligent on an individual basis, but obviously dumb as a sack of hammers on a collective basis to have polluted our atmosphere and oceans to give, lead us into this precarious situation. The acidification of the oceans multiple positive feedbacks, which are bad feedbacks. They make things go faster, act on each other to accelerate warming. Okay, so we've got to get this resilience back. If we, if we increase biomass on the planet, we increase our resilience a huge amount. So, the, so on land, what happens, what's contributed to the loss of biomass on land? So this is in particular is Europe, 1,000 BC, 300 BC, and so on to present day. Look at all the green forests here, which we massacred out. So the forested fraction, you know, this is 10%, 20%, 30%. We've basically completely destroyed 
you know, most of the forests in Europe. We wiped out megafauna, big carnivores in particular, apex predators leading to forest reduction, de desertification. We've cleared forests for agriculture. We've lost habitat. Human encroachment and contamination has cut off uh, mobility of, of species. We've overexploited stocks and uh, we've changed the soils. We've added fertilizer and chemicals, disrupted the ecology. We've disseminated invasive species. This is on land. Look at the oceans, the loss of biomass in the oceans. We, they started coming under extreme pressure about 500 years ago when shipping technology advanced so we could hunt, hunt large marine mammals like whales. Within 200 years, we, we wiped out most of the whales from the North Atlantic. By the middle of the last century, globally, we, we cut back, we, we got rid of 95% of, of, of the whales. Whale numbers globally were down to less than 5% of historic levels. Think of all the carbon that was stored in those whales. It is now in the atmosphere and, and ocean, free in the ocean. Fish stocks collapsed. We've lost 95% of the large fish in the sea. The nutrient cycles were disrupted. Huge decline of life across the oceans. Over the last 50 years, greater than 50% reduction in fish stocks alone in that time. Phytoplankton numbers collapsing. They're the base of the food chain. Oxygen production is down 50% since 1970 from phytoplankton. Then this is comparing 1900 fish in the, in the Atlantic to 2000. This isn't very smart. So summarizing the scale of the problem, these numbers are all in gigatons. Basically, the excess carbon in the atmosphere by 2040 is expected to be on the order of 560 gigatons, and that's comprised of extra CO, extra carbon in the ocean and in the atmosphere, and, and carbon that we're admit, committed to adding. In terms of the biomass, 5,000 years ago to present day, we've cut back about, we've lost about half of the biomass. Okay, what those numbers will be in 2040, we'll see. So. So if you take those numbers, that's about 4,000 gigatons. So 15% of 4,000 is 600. So if we restore about 15% of the lost biomass, this amount, 600 gigatons, that will basically cover the excess carbon and return us to about 280 ppm. Okay, this is the forest cover. Current is the dark. And former, you need to add the dark and the lighter around. So look at the look at the tropical forest cover. You know we've completely devastated forest cover on terrestrial forest cover. Look at the temperate for, uh, forest cover. The darker is current. Add in the lighter. Look at Europe and uh, parts of Asia. So we need to restore biomass. This this 8,000 gigatons is conservative probably, but it's fairly consistent number throughout the last five ice ages. In comes humans, and we've got rid of about 4,000 gigatons. So we have a huge carbon store readily available to us. So adding life provides a mechanism for its capture. Okay, now this is different from the small transfer of carbon out of the living carbon cycle into the rocks and sediments. That's only about five to 10 gigatons per year. So how realistic is biomass recovery? Uh, we need a growth medium, sunlight, and nutrients. Large areas of the ocean are nutrients deficient, so what we need to do is we need to restore balance in the system. So we, we, can, generate, we can generate phytoplankton, we can phytoplankton all the way up the food chain, we gain life, and we capture CO2 off of the ocean. If we remove it from the atmosphere, it will off gas from the ocean, acidity, acidity will start to reduce, we'll start kicking in these good feedbacks. If we take care of the biosphere, the biosphere will take care of us. We're certainly not doing that now. No other mechanism has the capacity to deliver at the necessary scale, economy, and safety. We might only have one shot at this. Okay, we stretch the biosphere to the limits, Bio and, and the Arctic is warming like crazy, we have risk of methane, we have to decarbonize our economy, we have to regrow biomass, we have to start immediately, and that will draw down CO2 levels. And this, is, uh, this will develop full employment and a global economic boom, you know, retooling society to uh, up the biomass. We can do this, we just need the political will.